thrombosis. Our CKD patients and the hemodialysis patients are at risk of bleeding tendency because of the uremia associated bleeding dysfunction, endothelial abnormalities, and the anticoagulants used on hemodialysis. Also, our patients are at high risk for thrombosis because many factors such as systemic inflammation, diffuse endothelial damage in these patients, low level and activity of protein CS and M thrombin 3, the use of hemodialysis filters and lines, the turbulence of blood flow during hemodialysis, high hematocrit value, and blood transfusions. This is a well-known uh, normal intrinsic and extrinsic clotting pathway that occurs in our body. Whenever there is a trauma to the endothelium, there will be activation of a cascade of clotting factors that will lead to, at last, the formation of blood clot. Our patients are at risk for activation of this pathway during hemodialysis because the attachment or the contact between the blood and the filters and lines of the hemodialysis machine will lead to activation of this clotting pathway and formation of extracorporeal system clotting. This is my dog outline including all the possible available anticoagulants, whatever they are used in practice or not, I will mention all. There are some which are heparin related, some are citrate related, and others. And finally, anticoagulation selection according to the patient risk. Starting by the heparin related anticoagulation methods, the first and the most commonly used is the unfractionated heparin. The site of action of unfractionated heparin is by blocking the activity of both active factor 10 and the activity of thrombin factor. This is a mechanism unfractionated heparin binds to anti thrombin 3 and anti-thrombin 3 unfractionated heparin complex will bind to activated factor 10 and inactivate it and blocking the clotting pathway. Also, the unfractionated heparin anti-thrombin complex will attach it to the thrombin, which is activated uh, factor 2A, and inactivate it also. So it is inactivating both the factor 10 and thrombin factor. administration methods, three methods, all of them by using uh, initial bolus of heparin. Routine heparin is using high initial bolus of heparin and the method C tight heparin by using low dose of bolus heparin. Both method A and method B after the bolus of heparin will use heparin as a constant infusion method by different doses. Method B, which is started by initial bolus, will use repeated bolus methods, not infusion methods and uh, these uh, types of type A and B, or only uh, the first initial dose with no bolus, with no repeated bolus doses. Starting by method A, there is no uh, ideal protocol for the use of heparin on hemodialysis. Multiple centers by multiple uh, experience, by multiple doses, even the guidelines are different in their uh, recommendations. This is one of the methods that used in intermittent hemodialysis by starting initial bolus dose of 2000, following by infusion dose of 1200 international units per hour of unfractionated heparin. The European Renal Practice Guidelines recommending initial bolus dose of 50 international units per kilogram, followed by 800 to 1500 international units per hour. If you are using this method for continuous renal renal replacement therapy, CRRT, it is recommended to use an initial bolus dose of 30 international units per kilogram, followed by infusion rate of 5 to 10 international units per kilogram per hour, targeting activated partial thromboplastin time of 1.5 to about 2 times normal. The target of using heparin or the monitoring of heparin can be monitored by clotting tests. Many clotting tests are available, actually, which is available in our country or what we are using is activated partial thromboplastin time. It is important during the dialysis to maintain the partial thromboplastin time of the patient of about during intermittent hemodialysis of about 2 to, point, two, 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 two point 2.5 time the normal. At the end of the analysis, it is important to be 1.5 to 2 times the normal value. So when to stop in this method the infusion, should I continue it to the end of the dialysis session? No, it is important to stop it about one hour before the end of the dialysis session because this will result in the desired clotting time at the termination of the session, which is about 1.5 to 2 times the normal. But actually, I don't know any center who is monitoring heparin by activated partial thromboplastin time on hemodialysis. 
actually use it without monitoring. Even if the patient is at least high risk of bleeding, we don't monitor it. We try to shift it to heparin free, free dialysis or go the tests and the guidelines recommending to use the uh, clotting time test. The second method is by using initial bolus followed by repeated boluses or only single initial bolus. Many center uh, experience as one center starting by 4,000 international unit followed by 1,000 to 2,000 international units so we need it. This is my center, my self-center experience. We start by 2,000 international unit as a polis at the start of dialysis. Then we give 1,000 international unit at the start of every hour during the hemodialysis. And finally, you may, some centers use only 2,000 international unit with no remitting doses. Again, there is no ideal protocol for the use of the heparin. The controller of your heparin dose is your patients. If you are using a, a certain protocol and the patient is not bleeding and not clotting, so it's okay. If it is a problem regarding excessive bleeding or excessive clotting, you have to adjust your dose. Okay. The third method is the diet heparin, the constant infusion method. When, when it must be used, it is recommended for patients who are at risk or at slight risk, slight risk for bleeding. Especially if we tried the heparin free dialysis method and it was not, it was unsuccessful because of frequent clotting. What is the methodology to use heparin uh, tight method? We start by obtaining a baseline clotting time at first, followed by initial bolus about 750 international units. After three minutes, we check your clotting time. If your clotting time not in the desired clotting time uh, level, uh, insert or administer another supplemental bolus dose. If you reach your desired clotting time, then start dialysis and heparin infusion at a rate of 600 international units per hour and follow your clotting time every 30 minutes. This may be used in patients who are at slight risk of bleeding tendency, but the heparin clotting, the heparin free dialysis uh, method was unsuccessful. Want to stop heparin in these methods, you have to continue the heparin till the end of dialysis session. Okay. If there is a clotting in spite of anticoagulation, in spite of you are using heparin, but the patient's extracorporeal system is clotted, the line is clotted, or the fertile is clotted, don't always blame heparin. It is not the only cause of clotting of the extracorporeal system. Many other causes can be present as inadequate dialyzer priming because of air retained in the dialyzer or inadequate priming maybe the dialysis circuits kinked, repeated kinked of the dialysis circuits or even a problem in the vascular axis because of inadequate blood flow because it is stenosed or recirculation of the axis or interruption of the blood flow and the stoppage of the dialysis session because of multiple alarm machine and finally if there is a problem in the heparin administration or those so don't always blame heparin especially if the, there is a recurrent extracorporeal clotting and you are sure that or you are giving your patients adequate heparin dose. But if it is recurrent clotting, it is important to reevaluate and adjust the heparin dose. Going to the complications of internalization, starting by bleeding, the instance of bleeding in patients, our patients, is from 10 to 50 percent. Mortality due to bleeding is as high as 15 percent. The risk of bleeding is directly proportional to the activated partial from the time and not the heparin dose. So it is important that the heparin dose may be individualized according to the response of our patient. And one important issue that some patients there is post therapy needed puncture site bleeding. Most of us again bleeding heparin that the patient has overdose of heparin. But again, don't always bring heparin. If post therapy needed puncture site with prolonged bleeding, there are important other causes rather than heparin. Sure, you will reevaluate your heparin dose, but don't forget one of the most common causes of post therapy needed puncture site bleeding is outflow stenosis of the vascular axis, especially if this repeated after every session. And also evaluate the technique of needle insertion by uh, the nurse. The second complication of hypnotization is heparin induced thrombocytopenia. It's a big, large issue. I will give short notes about it. Heat, heparin induced thrombocytopenia. It is secondary to heparin exposure. There will be thrombocytopenia plus minor thrombosis. The main cause is due to development of IgG antibodies against platelet factor 4 heparin complex. 
and the main cornerstone treatment is a stoppage of heparin or heparin and fractionated or low molecular weight heparin that I will talk about now and start non-heparin anticoagulants that I will mention. Other heparin associated complications, in short, the lipid disturbance, hyperkalemia because heparin causes suppression of aldosterone senses, some cases reporting pruritus and affiliatoid reactions within 30 minutes of the use of heparin have been reported in some cases, osteoporosis or long-term use, and some cases reported alopecia. The second heparin-related anticoagulation method is the low molecular weight heparin. Low molecular weight heparin is derived from unfractionated heparin by enzymatic degradation. Its molecular weight about 4,000 to 8,000. The site of action is mainly by inhibition of activated factor 10 and the slight anti-thrombin effect as it is derived from unfractionated heparin, so the length of the low molecular weight is small, it binds to antithrombin 3, its length is enough to inactivate factor 10, but its length is not enough to completely inactivate thrombin. So it has a good effect as an anti-factor 10 activity, but slightly minimal anti-factor 2A, which is the thrombin activity. In comparison with unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin has longer half life, more rapid onset of action than unfractionated heparin, higher bioavailability, more predictable effects, less non-specific binding to the endothelium, plasma protein, and the platelets, less platelets and leukocyte activation, it has no antidote, it is not reversible with brutamine sulfate as unfractionated heparin, less risk of heparin induced with thrombocytopenia, less bleeding and less thrombocytopenia, but heparin induced cytopenia occurs due to gross reactivity of antibodies, but less insulin than unfractionated heparin, less hyperkalemia, less disturbance of lipid profile, and also anaphylaxis ferris dose syndrome occurs in low molecular weight heparin as it occurs in unfractionated heparin. Regarding the comparisons for the most two important issues between low molecular weight heparin and the unfractionated heparin, regarding bleeding and thrombosis, Regarding to this meta-analysis, there was no difference between low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin regarding the incidence or the risk of bleeding. And regarding the incidence of thrombosis in our patient, the same meta-analysis shows that there is no difference in risk or incidence of thrombosis of extracorporeal circuit between low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin. That's why the European Renal Best Practice Guidelines recommend low molecular weight heparin as to be preferred of over unfractionated heparin in the usual daily intermittent hemodialysis session. Although low molecular weight heparins are very expensive and as they are not superior to unfractionated heparin, most of the countries all over the world, rather than Europe, are using unfractionated heparin rather than the low molecular weight heparin. This is the recommended dosage if you will use low molecular weight heparin for intra intermittent hemodialysis dosing. I will not go through that, but each type has its specific bolus dose. As it is long acting, as it is long acting, uh, actually the dose you will need to reduce the dose if there is a risk of bleeding. As it is long acting, you will need only single dose at the start of the dialysis session if you will dialysis your patient for only four hours. But if there is, will be extended dialysis session, you may need splitting the dose or we may need more than one dose. Regarding using low molecular weight heparin and CRRT, these are recommending dose of some of them, but actually it is not widely used in CRRT and there is limited experience for the, the use of low molecular weight heparin in chronic and continuous renal replacement therapy as also regarding the available data and the meta-analysis systematic reviews there is no reduced bleeding or increased filter survival by using lower molecular weight heparin in CRRT. How to monitor low molecular weight heparin is monitored by anti-factor 10 activity, but actually it is not available or uh, it, is, uh, it is difficult to be used and it is not available in most of the labs and is used only uh, by the uh, experimental procedures. One of the most important heparin-related anticoagulation methods is the heparin-free dialysis. When to use heparin-free dialysis if the patient has any risk for bleeding, for example, pericarditis, recent surgery, coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, intracerebral hemorrhage, active bleeding. Even some centers use heparin free dialysis as a routine for all acute ill patients or patients with heparin allergy. Even some centers use it for all patients, even they are not at risk for bleeding tendency. How to use heparin free dialysis? What is the method or what is the procedure? 
start by heparin rinse, you're priming extra corporeal circuit by using saline containing about 2,000 to 5,000 units of heparin per liter, rinse your machine, then drain the heparin containing priming fluid but unheparinized the saline to clear out the heparinized saline for your machine, then start your dialysis session by about blood flow 250 to 500. If you, uh, the higher the blood flow is the better as an anticoagulant. And finally, periodic saline rinse with about 50 to 250 ml of saline every 15 to 30 minutes. The first step is optional, especially if your patient has heparin induced thrombocytopenia, will not use heparin in the rinse. And the last point of rinsing is important to allow inspection of the hollow fiber dialyzer for evidence of clotting to exchange your dialyzer and your line. If you will use heparin free dialysis for CRRT, it is important to use the pre dilution method because the pre dilution method will allow more fluid to enter your dialyzer and reduce the hemoconcentration within the hemofilter when the plasma water is removed by convection methods and try to make your blood flow rate at least 2 ml per minute or higher. The higher is the better. The third or the fourth heparin-related anticoagulant method is regional anticoagulation with glutamine reversal. The idea here is that a high dose of heparin is used before the blood pump and the filter, and when the blood is going back to the patient, they use the antidote of the heparin, which is glutamine, to prevent this high dose heparin to go to the patients. But actually, this method is technically difficult and the rebound the bleeding occurs about two to four hours after the end of dialysis and it is not used. The rebound the bleeding is due to the glutamine heparin complex when it enters the body, the reticular and the cellular system will cleave it. So the heparin dose in the body of the patient will rise and cause excessive bleeding. So this is not used, just a historical method. The final method which is related to heparin is heparin coated filter. Many heparin coated filters are used in many experiments, but actually the final result is the coated membranes were associated with a significantly increased incidence of brain clotting if compared with any other method of anticoagulation regarding either citrate or heparin, so it is not popular to Go to the citrate-related anticoagulants, starting by the most common and famous regional citrate anticoagulation. It's the idea depends on the calcium is the extrinsic and the extrinsic clotting system cascade that we mentioned. Calcium is an important element for the common pathway activation. So if we will block, we will block calcium or we will be able to block calcium, clot will not be formed. So citrate as it is, or, or as it can bind to calcium, this is a patient, this is a dialysis machine and line. At the entry of the blood, we introduce citrate to the bloodline, citrate binds to calcium and chelates it. So no calcium, so no activation of the clotting system. But it is important to replace calcium, to replace patient with calcium because of the ineffective or inactivation of the calcium by citrate. So you have to replace your patient with sufficient amount of calcium. And it is important to know that citrate that will go back to the patient's body will be metabolized by the liver to bicarbonate. So there is a high incidence of kalemia on a long-term basis and it is important to decrease the dialysis solution by carbonate in these patients. And the major complications of regional citrate anticoagulation, hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia, if the replacement is less or more than wanted, hypernatremia because the citrate used is in the form of hypertonic citrate solution and metabolic alkalosis. But even in the presence of these complications, the regional citrate anticoagulation was compared to the heparin as anticoagulation procedure. Most of the studies found that re regional citrate anticoag uh, anticoagulation reduced bleeding risk more than heparin. Regional citrate anticoagulation has similar or better efficacy on circuit patency. Regional citrate anticoagulation reduced neutrophil and the combinant activation rather than heparin anticoagulation. That is why the PDU guidelines for the acute kidney injury that published since three years, recommends the use of regional citrate anticoagulation as the primary method for continuous healing replacement therapy if the patient has no risk of bleeding or if the patient has high risk of bleeding. So regional citrate anticoagulation is widely used for intermittent hemodialysis, but it is more popular for CRRT. 
Citrate, citrazid, citrazid is a bicarbonate acid solution with low concentration. Citrate, the main idea is also elevate the salicylate concentration of citrate, which will bind to calcium and decrease the calcium content and decrease the activation of the protein pathway. But further studies need to delineate its role and it is not widely used. Regarding the parinoids, we have danaparinoid and fundaparinox. They are anti-factor 10. They are not uh, popular to be used. They have a loading dose, meaning those the main problem that they need to be monitored by anti-factor 10, and they have prolonged half-life in patients with uh, renal impairment, so may lead to excessive bleeding. But the main use is in the management of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia if I can't use heparin. Also, the direct thrombin inhibitors as Argatropin, Lipirudine, and Bivalurinine are antithrombin factors. Also, they have loading dose, maintenance dose, difficult monitoring, prolonged uh, half life in renal patients, and their main use is in the management of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. If Lipirudine is not at present now, it is removed by uh, the buyer, the uh, publishing uh, company. It is replaced now by what is called the thrombex. It is a recombinant heroin. It is only the available drug now, and its dose is about 0.1 mg per kilogram bolus pre diagnosis. Finally, the platelet inhibiting agent prostacyclin and nafa mustad may be used, but they are also under trials, clinic, limited clinical experience, few published reports regarding its safety and efficacy. And my final slide, which is the home message, anticoagulation selection. This is again the risk of bleeding in our patients. Each method, how I can use it, starting by the first method, which is routine ultrafiltration, a routine unfractionated heparin high bolus dose with constant fusion, can be used in intermittent hemodialysis, CRRT, but it is important that the patient bleeding risk is zero. The second methodology, routine unfractionated heparin with poluses, multiple poluses or no poluses, can be used in intermittent hemodialysis, but it's important that the patient has no risk for bleeding. The third method, which is the tight minimum dose heparin, constant infusion method, can be used in intermittent hemodialysis and CRRT, but it is important that the patient has slight minimal risk of bleeding, especially if heparin free dialysis method failed. Low millimeter weight heparin can be used with intermittent hemodialysis. Some data are published regarding its use in CRRT, but not widely used with limited experience. It's important that the patient risk is zero. Heparin free dialysis can be both used for both intermittent hemodialysis and CRRT regarding the risk of bleeding of the patient, slight, moderate, or high. Regional anticoagulation with portamine reversal is not used till now. Heparin coated filter is not used only in experiments. Regional citrate anticoagulation is used mainly for CRRT. It can be used for any patient bleeding risk, slight, moderate, or high risk. Citrazate, which is a dialyzate containing citrate, is not used till now, not widely used. Heparinoids can be used for both intermittent hemodialysis CRRT. Mainly it is used for management of heat as a replacement of heparin. Direct thrombin inhibitor, as the same as heparinoids, can be used as a substitute for heparin in patients with heparin is used from cytopenia. And finally, the platelet inhibiting agents, prostacyclin and its derivatives, are not used widely here now. This is the website that Dr. Hussein said about it, nephrotubesin.com. It contains this lecture and other multiple lectures related to nephrology. And the Facebook group for daily discussions, MCQs, and uh, cases is called the Nephrotube. You will find the link of the Facebook group on the website. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation.